Well, I am an acupuncturist, holistic health practitioner here in Portland, Oregon. Uh, I run a small holistic health uh, practice, uh, Zen Space Wellness, and now we have a second location, the Wellness Doctors. And this is my friend, Emily. Hi, I'm Emily. I'm a dietitian in the Portland area, and I specialize in intuitive eating and health at every size principles. And if you've been paying attention to our YouTube chats, we've been kind of diving into diet culture, body positivity, some of the issues around those topics. And today our chat is trying to put that all together. So, you know, uh, what, what do some of those concepts mean? What do they look like in real life? And, you know, some tangible ideas around how you can implement them in your life in a, in a positive way. So first question, Emily, is what are some of the health habits that are rooted in actual health but can also be appropriated by diet culture? Yeah, so just about everything healthy for your body has been appropriated by diet culture at some point. Um, you know, one thing that I really think about a lot is like the powders, like there's such a huge array, array of like special powders that are like jam packed with a bunch of stuff. Um, and while that's totally great, and maybe that's something you utilize, maybe like a protein powder or something like that. Um, I feel like sometimes it's really, they take all of those things and say, oh, it's so necessary to buy my like $50 you know, supplement powder kind of thing. Um, so when like, you know, the ingredients might be like ground flax seeds and ground isn't like you could have just like bought that somewhere else. So a lot of times it ends up being like a marketing thing. Um, collagen is like a huge, like people dive like so hard into that trend. Um, you know, really anything too that's marketed as a superfood it's not really a regulated term at all. It's just kind of like a marketing term. Those foods might be super for you, but it's like, you know, a goji berry and an apple, like we don't need to be spending like $45 on berries, like an ounce of dry goji berries versus like, you know, an apple. So I think it just makes um, wellness, the industry in general, just kind of makes it seem far away to obtain those healthy things. Or, you know, if you don't buy all these powdered supplements, um, then you're not going to be able to do anything healthy for yourself. Um, so I think that diet culture kind of takes those foods and uses the marketing on them and makes them more unattainable. That's funny that you mentioned that because um, I find that with a lot of those powders, what they're doing is also like appropriating indigenous foods. Oh, <laughs> so 100%. For, yeah, like for example, goji berries are a Chinese herb. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, and sometimes in Chinese medicine, they're called for and we prescribe them to people, but also mm -hmm. sometimes that might not actually be the best herb for you for what you have. Right. Going on. Um, I think it's important to remember that, you know, you don't need you don't need like everything 100% of the time. There are times when your body may need a certain food more than, than another food or whatever. Um, and then I'm from Hawaii and noni fruit, just like it blew up too. Um, also mock or not maca, but um, kava that blew up. Oh yeah. And in Portland, especially there's so much kava stuff in Portland. Yeah. And those are like traditional Hawaiian um, herbs really that, you know, have, like are rooted in, in Hawaiian culture. Um, and it's just funny to see people all about them and maybe they don't even actually like know where they're from traditionally, how they're used traditionally. You know, like kava, for example, you know, there's a ceremony around it that people do. And um, I don't think that, you know, like if you go to a bar, you know, I'm not saying that it's yeah. to go to a kava bar in Portland, but yeah, it's definitely like you're missing, you're missing the ceremony of it. Right. Um, totally. So I, yeah, that's interesting that you bring that up because I think, you know, white Western culture like loves to appropriate indigenous. Yeah. Even if you have like, like if you go to the Asian markets and you can find like organic goji berries for like a third of the price that you will at Whole Foods when they're like packaged and they're little like fancy box and stuff. Yeah, <laughs> it's interesting. Absolutely. 
Mm -hmm. um, okay, so I wrote this question kind of like leading into to the topic of cleanses. And I thought this would be a really interesting topic for us. I actually have a lot of thoughts around cleanses myself. I like wrote an entire blog post on it, um, like a, a long one. It was a term paper actually that I wrote for my doctoral program that I just posted as a blog post. <laughs> uh, um, and I, I, you know, full disclosure, like I've tried pretty much every cleanse, detox, fast you can think of um, because, well, I guess I could say I started because, you know, I started with it because in health food stores in Hawaii, you could buy these like little packages of herbs or whatever that was like intestinal detox and, and or liver detox or, you know, parasite detox, which it's really just like take these herbs for a short time along with your normal diet, maybe cut out some sugar and caffeine or whatever. Um, it'll help you flush your liver. That's gonna help your digestion even more. And it started like that, but then once I started getting into it, you know, then you you start reading all these things, you know, you start learning about like the master cleanse, which is basically a starvation diet. Mm -hmm. uh, I remember Beyonce did a movie called Dream Girls in 2006 and she, wrote a whole, there was like a whole article in like a magazine that I was reading at the beach in Hawaii one day where Beyonce, you know, the master cleanse, you're only supposed to do it for two weeks. She did it for an entire month, which is basically, she starved herself to like look really good in this movie. And I remember Jessica Simpson too, when she did, what was that movie she did where she was wearing those Daisy Dukes? Oh yeah, Dukes of Hazard. Dukes of Hazard, yeah. She was so thin in that movie and then come to find out she had basically starved herself. Like just, we all know Jessica Simpson is not that teeny tiny anymore. Mm -hmm, you know? mm -hmm. um, and then I think J-Lo, there's J-Lo, like every new year J-Lo talks about how she's cut out like sugar and carbs like for mm -hmm. January because just to like reboot herself, which all mm -hmm. of that I would say is diet culture. So anything any kind of cleanse or detox or, or um, fast, they're all basically the same term for the same thing, which is, a, you know, serious caloric restriction and basically like just starving yourself. So anything I would say, anything that is like, don't eat food, take a bunch of supplements and call that food, um, starve yourself, you know, for extended period of time. And then the most probably dangerous ones I would say are um, starve yourself in the workout a ton or like go yeah. sit in the sauna for like a long period of time. That's all like really, really, really bad. That can mess with your, you know, your adrenals. It can mess with your hormones. It can mess with your um, electrolyte balance, which can be really dangerous as if you're sweating out all of your electrolytes and then like not putting anything else into your body that can like cause serious like nerve dysfunction and stuff like that. So that is all diet culture. Um, that being said, there are some times that I do think that clean, like quote unquote cleansing yourself can be good, but I wouldn't like, for example, when I talk to my patients about these sorts of things, it's um, okay, maybe simplify your diet a little bit. Like maybe your, maybe your digestion's funky. Let's try to heal your gut. So by doing that, we want to maybe cut out some common allergens, but never, ever, ever have I ever told my patients to starve themselves or to not eat food because we all need food. We need to eat food to live. Um, if we stop eating, we will die, you know? <laughs> um, so what are, what are your thoughts on it? Because you know, this kind of blew up recently on social media because Lizzo posted, you know, Lizzo is like, our, you know, body positive goddess, right? Mm -hmm. And she posted something where she did a detox and some people were really upset about it. And some people were like, let Lizzo live. Like she's allowed to do detoxes too, if she wants. Um, so I'd love to hear your thoughts on it. Yeah. So it's, there's so many different, you kind of mentioned there's so many different definitions of cleanses in general. So it's hard to like, even really say one like solid thing about it. Um, but you had kind of mentioned the herbs and everything. I mean, in dietetics, you know, we are using like mostly at least my like base education is mostly like Western medicine rooted. Right. So the focus, when we talk about cleansing or something like that, or like liver support, that's really what people are meaning when they're talking about cleansing. Right. Um, and so I, I, to me, it's like so much better if you're like, okay, if you feel like that's something that you need or your physician or whatever is saying that, then maybe like some kind of liver supporting enzyme supplement, whatever would be a better choice for you than like to go down this rabbit hole of all those foods. 
um, like restricting all those foods and the elimination diet. That's basically what, um, like we call what you're mentioning, like the common allergens. Like if you have some sort of digestive problem or, you know, maybe you have a sensitivity that you don't know about. And that's a totally great option to like weed out what's going on, um, with a provider, right. It's kind of hard for people to do that on their own. Cause they're just like freewheeling it, having like no idea what is what, um, and with the Lizzo thing, oh, it's so hard because, you know, so many people saw that and felt really betrayed. Like, oh, this is this person that I really look towards um, as an example of being really body positive and comfortable in her own skin. And we're assuming, okay, like now she's not because she's like doing this cleanse. And I think it would have been different if she didn't post like photos of her body with it. And it seemed very much like, look, this is how I looked on day one. And then this is how I looked on day 10 and I like see a good difference. And she's not really like saying exactly what that is. Um, but at the same time, when people are angry with her about that, it's like, she's a victim like anybody else is of this like pressure and, you know, needing to look a certain way or feel a certain way. And it just can be really, um, that's so much pressure. And while she certainly didn't ask for that pressure, it's definitely something that like she uses a lot and focuses on. Um, there was quite a few black dietitians who had some good commentary on it by basically saying that, you know, she's not here to like teach you everything and she's going to mess up too. And she's human. And the people that we need to like really put the blame on and everything is, um, like the master of people that are perpetuating diet culture, which are these industries, you know, perhaps this nutritionist that gave her this protocol to do. And like she said, you know, she wasn't starving herself and all of, you know, blah, blah, blah. But like, at the same time, providers need to know like deep history about someone before they provide them any kind of restrictive diet that takes out certain food groups. You know, if you have a history of an eating disorder and then like, I've heard so many people, oh, I'll do whole 30 but I had history of an eating disorder. And then that just kicked me right back into my disorder. So it's not safe to recommend that point blank for people um, like you were kind of mentioning, but I think, you know, that's on your provider to know and to ask those proper questions to decide if that's going to be like a right path for you. Um, so as usual, what one person did wellness wise should mean like pretty much zero to you. <laughs> and it's super individual. And I don't think that blaming her is proper. Um, I think we just need to really look at the root of everything and realize that this system is so oppressive that even someone who we really all look towards as this example of body positivity can totally still be taken under by that. It's no one's immune to it. Yeah, absolutely. So I posted around that whole topic. I had posted oh, some questions on, on Instagram about, you know, do you have any questions about cleansing? Because I, I'm not anti quote unquote cleansing, but I do think that there, I do think it's been appropriated by diet culture quite a bit. And mm -hmm. I don't think people who do a quote unquote cleanse really understand what they're doing it for. Anyway, I, my question was, do you have any questions about cleansing? And um, the questions I got back were like, I want to do a cleanse, but it's to heal my gut. Um, and, you know, what is your favorite cleanse? And I think the easiest way, so we feel, we may feel, you know, uncomfortable, like bloated, some have some digestive imbalance after we've like Lizzo said, she went to Mexico, ate a bunch of food, drank a bunch of alcohol, just felt like she needed to reboot herself. Um, that's totally fair. I mean, I think we can all relate to that feeling, right? Like we've all kind of mm -hmm. overindulged and been like, man, I need to take a break from alcohol. Mm -hmm. Maybe we need to stop eating so much sugar. I feel like shit right now. Like I need to mm -hmm. feel better about myself again. I need to feel more vital or whatever. And that's totally fair. And there are you know, some scientific studies about cleanses that do show that it does help. Some of them do help with cell regeneration and that sort of thing. However, um, when you want to do a cleanse, you have to first ask yourself, why do you want to do that cleanse? This is something we talked about in our last talk. Yes. When you want to do this cleanse, what are you trying to get out of it? What are you looking for? And if the question is, if the answer to that question is ever weight loss, that is not a, that's not a good reason to do a, a cleanse or a detox, right? Like mm -hmm. I've done cleanses and detox where I've not lost a pound, you know, mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. that, 
anything that's going to have you lose a bunch of weight really, really quickly is, <laughs> is just a fad diet really like yeah. in this way of being like, no, it's not a diet. It's a cleanse to make you feel better. Like, no, that's actually just a diet. Somebody is telling you to starve yourself and take their supplements and spend a bunch of money. Yeah. And, and you know, you're going to lose weight momentarily and then you're going to take a bunch of pictures and post about it and you know post mm-hmm. that person or that cleanse or whatever and then you're going to gain a bunch of weight back because you just screwed with your metabolism at this point right. um, when I first went to Chinese medicine school I got really into like Perium because it was like this I, I, know, I had a bunch of friends selling it online and I was like I like cleanses I'll do this Perium okay. cleanse this sounds great Oh, it's like, you can still eat food with it. I liked that. Like you could, it's still, it told you to still eat food. It was like, eat vegan. The guy who started it is vegan. Mm -hmm. Eat vegan. Um, Don't eat that much. Mostly drink this like green drink. That's like so expensive to buy Mm -hmm. uh, for for like one month and you're going to feel amazing and so much better. And um, so I tried it and I signed up for the little pyramid scheme that they have going on because it was cheaper for me to get the cleanse. Honestly, it was super expensive. <clears throat> and I kind of had fun with it in the beginning. And then I quickly realized, oh, they expect you to be promoting that people are doing this like two week cleanse every single month. Like they want you to continuously have people buying these products. They want them to basically be doing this every single month. And that is absolutely not healthy. You're not <laughs> supposed to like not eat food like, you know, that is just diet culture. Right. So I was really yeah. in that in the end, because it, it was, it was something that seemed like they were trying to promote like health, right? They mm-hmm. were mm-hmm. veganism for a short period of time, which I think it's great to cut out meat once in a while. Like if you're a meat mm-hmm. eater, like take a break from meat once in a while, just help your, you know, digestive tract, you know, it can be hard to digest mm-hmm. meat. Um, and then you can take it back up again. Like mm-hmm. there are things that I think can be good momentarily to take out of your diet but when anything that's telling you to take before and after pictures take measurements of your body um Mm. not eat really like restrict your calories quite a bit I think like the period cleanse has you eating like a thousand calories a day or something crazy Mm, which is less than what a toddler needs (laughs) yeah it's just truly um that is all just like a diet that's like repackaged Mm -hmm. to make you feel good about dieting because you know, I think we can all agree that dieting sucks. And, um, so it's nicer to think that you're on a cleanse instead of, on. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I wouldn't say that that's a real cleanse, you know, and yeah. in the health, like in Chinese medicine, and even in Ayurvedic medicine, the idea of detoxing for short periods of time is something that people use, you know, that's like, um, kind of a traditional, like a traditional thing that I don't know that these medicines promote, but yeah. one of them, like in Ayurveda, to my knowledge, and not that I'm super well versed in Ayurveda, but I've done an Ayurvedic cleanse before, and it still has you eating food. You know, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. I've done a cleanse like in Chinese medicine. You know, they really the idea of cleansing kind of around like the pivots of the seasons. So in Chinese medicine, they talk about doing a cleanse in like spring and in fall because that's when <clears throat> that's when it's easiest for your body to kind of like be adaptive and changing because in the winter you know it's really cold our body has certain needs of of staying warm so it wouldn't be good to eat a bunch of like raw foods or something like that in the winter they say and then in the summer it's really really hot it's like oppressively hot in your body so it's not a good time to be eating you know a lot of like broths or stuff like that because you need more cooling foods to kind of help like mm-hmm. get your temperature in your body so around spring and fall is when they actually say you know temperature wise the climate is a little bit more temperate it's easier for you to kind of play with your diet um, and do some things that help you roll into the next season and have the, like the best digestive health for that season. So if you want to learn more about it, you can. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's it's super interesting. And it also goes show like, that's not really, you know, that feels completely out of my scope of practice, like 100%. It just kind of goes to show that like, that's not, that's like a medicine thing and not really like a nutrition Mm -hmm. thing right like so it's kind of like it does it makes complete sense where it's like it has a place in these cultures and these branches of medicine but you know the things that everyone are doing like the different cleanses whole 30 blah blah blah, all these different things are like all nutrition focused 
but like a true like dietitian nutritionist will not tell you to do that for nutrition purposes. Right. So what you're saying makes so much sense. Yeah. Anyway, well, that's my soapbox on cleanses, but I just thought it would be a really interesting topic for us to bring up um, just because right now we're, you know, we're moving into new years and in January, basically diet culture, like really, really, really ramps up, um, you know, and you're going to see a lot of people doing these like cleanses and detoxes. And really all it is, is, is trying to shame you for, you know, maybe eating a cookie or two during Christmas time and, Mm -hmm. you know, focusing on weight, which is, is really harmful and toxic. So I would just Mm -hmm. encourage everyone to like, not play into that this year. Mm -hmm. Um, like the, the, let's like make 2021 not be the goal of, of weight loss. And yeah, all those people that start talking about the COVID weight, like, let's just mute them. <laughs> yeah. Let's not. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, okay. So when do you think it's appropriate for people to have some food rules? Is that appropriate? Yeah. So um, there's something we were kind of talking before about how you know, intuitive eating gets kind of misappropriated in certain ways. Um, I think partially because we, and we had mentioned this in other talks that it's, everybody knows like they should be eating fruits and vegetables. And we have all of these, um, you know, cake or cookies on a pedestal, like they're super exciting foods and really high value to us because we've kind of viewed them as bad and we want to restrict them. Um, But there are certain food rules that, you know, like, let's say if you have a medical issue that prevents you from eating certain foods, like let's say you have celiac disease and you can't have gluten, um, perfectly reasonable. You have to have those food rules. Um, that has nothing to do with you being restrictive or not. And it has everything to do with you just supporting your health, which intuitive eating really wants you to do. Right. Especially at the beginning of your journey with it, you might find yourself reaching for, you know, foods like cookies and cake and ice cream more often just because our body's like, wow, we can finally have this. Like, this is really new and exciting. Um, but if we're applying that mindful eating to it, and if we're listening to the body and we're practicing all the parts of intuitive eating, then eventually we'll level off and you'll start to eat more of what your body's really wanting. Um, so, we kind of want to come back to the why with the food rules. If it's from a space of control or if it would give you anxiety to, you know, have to break that food rule because of like weight issues, um, then it's probably not a productive rule or be really careful too. You know, we say to so many people like the science, if it's something that you need to not eat for your health, then don't eat it, of course. But sometimes people have these assumptions that they can't eat certain things for their health, but it's not necessarily true. And it's like a rule diet culture rule that they've gotten, you know, like not everyone is lactose intolerant, right? Like, so there's certain things that like we have fear around that might not be fully real for you. Um, So if it's for your health, of course it's necessary, but just being really clear and understanding, you know, like if you go gluten-free because your sister did it and lost 10 pounds or because you just feel better when you eat lettuce on a burger instead of a bun, you know, something like that, then, you know, maybe you don't have to be completely gluten-free to reap all those benefits. And so just being really cautious and asking yourself and figuring out where all this stuff comes from. Right. So I think that's really important to come back to the why of it. But of course, if you have medical issues, celiac, you know, or if you have some kind of ethical stipulation, right, like I'm ethically vegan and I feel like I still have food freedom. So um, it's definitely possible. Um, So rules like that are definitely appropriate. You just have to come back to your why. Yeah. I think that's where it all comes down to, right? Like asking yourself, what the intention is like intention matters what is the intention behind anything that you're doing and if the intention is based in something that is there to shame you or make you feel bad then maybe that's not the greatest reason to do it right Mm -hmm. um so there are some diseases that and you touched on this a little bit but there are some diseases that require a bit of attention to diet And can you talk about what some of those are? I mean, you just talked about celiac disease, um, Mm -hmm. but what might some others kind of be like, what, what do you see in the people that you work with? Yeah. So, um, it could be like, you know, obviously specific food allergies or issues. That one's kind of obvious. Um, 
diabetes is definitely one of them where you just need to be kind of like more conscious. I like to say conscious rather than like watchful or sensible or something, um, more conscious of your carbohydrate intake and how you're structuring it with your insulin, right? Like they know all about that. Um, but intuitive eating is not, isn't about avoiding health advice or avoiding dietary advice. It's about making it work for you. So for example, people who have diabetes, intuitive eating can be so helpful for them because of course you have to tailor it to you, right? Maybe you can't eat whatever all the time that you want in the beginning, when you're working out, you have to do it within your parameters, but we're really getting in tune with the body and developing that interoceptive awareness which can be so valuable for people with diabetes because they're starting to learn, oh, what, what does it really feel like when my blood sugar is low or high? And so it can give them a little bit more information about their body, which is what we're trying to do with intuitive eating. Um, you know, and there can be all sorts of different things that you might need to adjust your diet for. Like if you, you know, I like to do like more of the adding in of foods rather than subtracting. Like, you know, if someone has high cholesterol or high blood pressure or something, I like to focus on the foods that we know can lower that rather than worrying so much about all the foods we need to take out simply because you just get a better result with that. And who doesn't want to just learn more about what foods they need to include more rather than um, foods that they need to erase completely. Um, you know, so sometimes that's definitely necessary and you just are using your judgment and hopefully a good provider that can understand the realistic, like, you know, for example, with dialysis, when um, patients are on their end stage of kidney disease, um, you know, I, I did my internship in Texas and corn is one of the things that they're like, oh, you shouldn't really be eating that. And there are a lot of food rules for those patients. Don't get me wrong. And I know this isn't like a huge percent of the population, but um, you know, they would tell these people, Mexican people who live in Texas, like, oh, you can't have corn tortillas anymore. And they're like, uh, like that's not gonna work, you know? So there would be some dietitians who'd be like, nope, like that's completely off the table. And then there's like, would be some more people who are conscious like, okay, how can we make this work for you in a way that supports your health and, supports um, what you want to eat. So it's basically just like finding a way to kind of have a happy medium with it. Like, oh, maybe, you know, instead of eating five of them, you can eat two of them, you know, certain different adjustments that we can make. And then how can we make, when we don't have the corn tortilla, how can we make that meal still satisfying for you? So there's definitely so many little individualistic markers, which is why it's great to read books. It's great to listen to podcasts, but working with someone is really informative for you and kind of the best, um, action you can take. Yeah. You know, I'll have, sometimes I'll have people, um, just be like, can you write a blog post on lowering blood pressure? And I've always been hesitant to do that because I think that lowering blood pressure might look different for one person than for another person. And I would prefer mm -hmm. that an individual will come and sit down with me and we can talk about why they have high blood pressure and right. kind of get to like the root cause of it. And then maybe I can make some recommendations, but writing like a catch all blog post of like <laughs> to lower blood pressure, you should do this. Doesn't seem, doesn't seem wise to me because I feel like that could be perpetuating some, you know, diet myths basically, mm -hmm. because you know, some people might just have blood pressure, high blood pressure because they have a lot of stress in their life. Maybe we just need to focus on stress management. Maybe their blood pressure isn't super crazy high. It's just like kind of, you know, arbitrarily high and, and mm -hmm. higher than we would like to see it. Maybe somebody's got high blood pressure, you know, for whatever reason. Mm -hmm. um, it's different for everyone, right? Like maybe they smoke two packs of cigarettes a day, like Mm -hmm. And like cutting out a bunch of foods is not really going to make a difference. Right. So. <laughs> and, and why yeah. should they? Like if they're, if, you know, you have, sometimes it's like, yeah, if, you know, we could cut this out, we could do that. But when we don't even know if we need to do that, like why give everybody, as you mentioned, like the same advice, it's just kind of silly. Or people look at it and be like, oh, well, they said I have to start walking two miles a day to like lower my blood pressure. Like, well, I'm not going to do that. I don't have the time for that oh, well, like, guess my blood pressure is just going to stay high forever. So it's kind of like, unless like, no, there's so many different avenues, but it's hard to explain that in like a short post or something. Yeah, absolutely. And I think there are a lot of people who, who will just happily give 
arbitrary diet advice or lifestyle advice without having any idea what they're really talking about online. Yeah. And I think that it's important to kind of be wary of, of that, be wary of anything that's going to tell you that they have all the answers to everything because mm -hmm. that's just not true. It's like no, no diet, no, no doctor, honestly, like even a Western doctor, they're, they're not going to have all of the answers for every single disease that you have. Like that's mm -hmm. kind of people specialize in things, right? Like, right. Um, right. so anyway, yeah, just be careful of that. I would say. So the mm -hmm. fifth question is coming from, from a listener. Um, they were saying, you know, they really want to embrace like intuitive eating and body positivity, but you, they have an autoimmune disorder. Um, and, you know, need to eat appropriately for that, need to eat a little bit more of a low inflammatory, you know, diet um, to mm -hmm. kind of help them stay out of pain because their, their disorder causes chronic inflammation and pain. Um, so how do they do, you know, how do they do that, I guess? Um, and I think you did touch on this a little bit in your last answer, but just kind of tailoring it a little bit more to like, how do you embrace intuitive eating, but also pay attention to some guidelines that you have to pay attention to? Yeah. So I would get really clear on what works for your body, particularly like if you're doing something and it feels really, really good and it feels sustainable to you and you feel as though you are being intuitive about choices, um, that might work fine for you. There's a lot of autoimmune protocol diets out there and it's not one size fits all. Um, you know, like the nightshade thing. And there's just so, there's so many different uh, iterations of that. But intuitive eating is, as we mentioned with the diabetes discussion, it's really perfect for someone who needs to be conscious of how their body feels when they eat certain foods, because we're heightening that awareness. Um, and it's, we're returning that relationship and it's a constant feedback between, okay, I ate this, like what's happening, right? Um, and then acknowledging that there's other things going on too, you know, like, it's like the MSG thing, like the physician who ate a bunch of Chinese food and was like, oh, MSG is now the devil. And that was like this horrible thing to eat because I felt sick after I ate Chinese food and it must be bad. So we want to be really careful of avoiding those correlations that we might find that aren't exactly causations. Um, you know, it was just because he ate a load of sweet and sour chicken that was deep fried. Like, yeah, that's going to make your stomach hurt a little bit. You know, you're passing around all the plates of food. Um, so we, and we know now like, okay, MSG is, there's no relationship with that and like poor health. Um, anyways, so intuitive eating is not just about eating cookies every single day, all day for every meal. It's about checking in with yourself and combining the gentle nutrition with what will satisfy you in a sustainable way. Um, you know, you want to make all the choices you can for your health, but you want to do that in a way that is stable. So if there's times when like, if you can't adhere to the diet that you're on, it's, it's not going to be the diet for you, whether, you know, maybe you make certain concessions in other ways, you know, maybe you take certain supplements to try and help combat that, especially on a day where you're like, okay, no, I'm going to want to eat this. Um, that's really individual, but keeping a healthy relationship with food is key to lowering stress. And that's helping all of those issues as well, whether it's an autoimmune thing or any, we know any disease state is helped by lower stress. So we wanna make sure that you're on some kind of diet that is not going to be triggering a bunch of stress for you or, you know, is difficult to adhere to because it just doesn't work. Even if you think that's the absolute best thing for me, if it's not something that you can adhere to and be happy with, it might not be the best one. Yeah, totally. I mm -hmm. mean, I like when I first started going to acupuncture school, it's, you know, very much in like the holistic realm. And for some reason, I don't know, like a lot of holistic practitioners think that coffee is like the devil. And mm -hmm. I kind of felt like I needed to like give up coffee to be a healthy person. And so that my, you know, so that I wasn't, I don't know, but they like, there's a whole story around, you know, if you're living off of false energy, then, you know, your body mm. never really can make its own real energy and this and that. And uh -huh. I like tried to give up coffee and then I just realized that like, I enjoy coffee. And if that yeah. is like, one of my only vices that I have in my life, then <laughs> <laughs> whatever I'm just gonna go ahead and do it and and yeah. honestly I started drinking less coffee like I have like one cup a day sometimes if it's you know a particularly hard day maybe I'll have like a second but you know I, I am 
I am sensitive to caffeine, so I don't drink coffee too late in the day. And so it mm-hmm. generally turns out to be just me having one cup of coffee a day. And if that brings joy to my life, well, how, how is that bad? You know? Right. And, <laughs> and that's you, like, that's such a perfect example. Everything you just said of, oh, I like coffee. Here's how I can eat it in a way or drink it in a way that's supporting my health. Like, it's not like you're sitting there drinking 10 cups of coffee a day because you like coffee. It's just not what truly happens when we're living without all the rules. It's just, it's not, it's such a huge, even like that comes up so often for me. Like everyone says, it's funny. I was actually talking to my dad about this. He's like, Oh, I'm trying to cut back a little on coffee. And I was like, why? Cause he drinks like two cups a day. And he's like, I don't know. Like, I just feel like I should cut back like for no reason, no, like true solid reason. Um, and so I was telling him like, you know, sometimes there's been studies with patients who have like lower, um, immune system function. When they drink coffee, they have a better immune function. So, and there's antioxidants in coffee. There's a lot of great benefits of coffee. And then it was like a week later. And I told him, Oh, I've got like the anxiety caffeine spiral going on right now. And he's like, see, I told you the caffeine is so bad for you, right? Like people don't like, it's so hard to have both of those things be true. You know, and I'm like, no, you could have two cups of coffee. Like if that's working for you, but for me, if I have like a two shot espresso latte, it's like hardly like eight times out of 10, it's not a good idea. Um, so it just goes to show like, there's so many different levels of everything and it's so nuanced. There's no like, Oh, this is just how much coffee you should drink a day. And that's it. Yeah. I, um, also lived in Germany when I was an exchange student, this is a little tangent, but I lived in Germany and I lived, um, in a farm Mm -hmm. on a farm. Um, the people, I was an exchange student. The people I lived with were were farmer, they were dairy farmers. So, Mm -hmm. um, I came in from like this little girl from Hawaii who like (laughs) soy milk, like thought dairy was the devil. I'm like living with (laughs) dairy farmers and they're like, for one, like my Oma there, she's always like, dairy is so good for you. Like, oh, you're feeling <laughs> sick? Drink a cup of warm milk. You can't sleep yeah. <laughs> warm milk. Like, like she could not wrap her head around the idea that like dairy could possibly be anything but like super healthy and nutritious for you. Um, mm-hmm. They are also doing dairy farming in a really like holistic way. But, um, and then also, you know, the like life of a farmer is they wake up really early in the morning. They eat a little breakfast. They they drink coffee, they go work with the animals and stuff. They come back for lunch, have a big lunch and then drink more coffee because then they go back out and they're working until like after dark, you know? So the whole idea of not drinking coffee also to them was like completely absurd. And there is nothing that will put like cultish diet rules into perspective, like going to another country, um, another culture. And like, if you were to try to tell some, like a French person, I don't know if you've ever been to France, but they eat baguettes, like it's going out of style. Mm -hmm. I tell them like, you don't eat bread because of gluten. They'd be like, what are you talking about? Yeah. (laughs) You know what I mean? And I'm not to say there's not French people who are celiac because yes, that is a real. Right. (laughs) However, it is not as prevalent as everybody seems to think it is. Like there are people, right. There are people who have celiac disease and there are people who that don't and you know, Anyway. Yes. Okay. <laughs> but, totally. Um, okay. So where do you think a healthy relationship with diet, with like diet and the body lies really? Yeah. So I think that's when you're really making your own choices and feeling truly empowered in those decisions. Um, you're choosing things that feel good and taste good and nourish your body. And those might not be all at the same time. Um, it's just having that kind of pure ownership over what's going into your body and how you're feeling and how you're making those food um, decisions Um, and allowing yourself to mess up too. You're still going to overeat sometimes. Nobody is completely immune to this. It's, you know, sometimes it happens if you're excited, if you're distracted, if you really love that's your favorite food and you know, that's your favorite food. Sometimes it's going to happen. So really giving yourself grace and continuing to view everything as a learning experience rather than some big mistake. Um, Healthy relationship is that constant feedback between body and mind surrounding nourishment. And it's something that feels good for you. It's not about like the rules that you learned were good for you and then applied, but didn't really even know. Um, It's really, it's just that true empowerment to me. I love that. I don't even have anything to add. That's perfect. Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, 
what are some like helpful tips or advice that you, that you like to give your patients? Yeah. So the top thing that I can say is to just go slowly. It's not a race. Think about how many years you have spent dieting, hating your body, um, feeling anxious over your food choices. For most people, I mean, it starts like early teenager time. So, you know, by the time you're 30 years old, getting advice on that, it, it might've been like 15 years in the making. Okay. It's not going to just completely reverse in six months. It's just not, um, you know, my favorite sessions with clients are about a single event. Like I've had like a 45 minute conversation with someone about when they were getting a candy bar from a vending machine that week, or, you know, a trip to PDX sliders with their family. You know, we like really take these situations and kind of deconstruct them and extract all of this information that we can glean from it, you know, by asking certain questions like, okay, like, what was your experience eating? What was the sensation? Where was your mind at during all these different things? Um, so it's very like minute details um, that you can kind of use these small experiences to expand bigger, to get more information about how you relate to food. Um, it's a lifelong process of getting to know yourself and you will see the benefits, I promise, um, just sticking with it because that reward of feeling free from all that garbage is just too great to give up on. Yeah. Yeah, mm -hmm. I mean, um, oftentimes when I have patients who are asking, you know, asking me a certain thing, it, what I always tell them is to kind of get back to something we've been talking about this entire time, but like get back to the why of, of why they're feeling badly about any certain thing. Like, why do they think that they shouldn't be eating this one item? Like, are they, you know, is it because somebody told them they shouldn't eat it? Um, is it because they just don't feel well when they eat it? Is it because, mm -hmm. you know, the media told them they shouldn't eat it? Like, what is it exactly about that? Because honestly, like, we just have to all have grace with ourselves. And that is probably the biggest piece of advice that I give all of my patients because it's, it's almost relevant in like every situation because yeah. one person, you know, might feel badly about not working out for one reason. One person might feel badly about, you know, eating something for another reason. It's always different. So my advice is kind of always changing for people, but just like having grace with yourself when you feel like, you know, you did something wrong or whatever, like <clears throat> we all make, you know, we all, we all have a, an idea of how we want to live our lives. And then that doesn't always go perfectly all of the time. And we can't sit there and beat ourselves up about, right. you know, about one little event because like, who's that, who's that help? Life is too short, man. Who's that helping yeah. really? You know, like if mm -hmm. you're sitting there and beating yourself up a, a hour later after you ate a bite of ice cream, because you know, you're trying not to eat sugar or whatever, like who is that really helping? And also now mm -hmm. you're like, you are putting this, sugar, ice cream or whatever onto a pedestal. And now you probably are like obsessing on it and wanting it more. So just have grace yep. for yourself and just know that like we all eat like five-year-olds sometimes, you know? Mm -hmm. And it's, to it's totally like, that's such an important thing to say because, you know, people think that if, oh, intuitive eating, if it's about like not caring what I'm eating or just like giving up on it, like who cares? Like I've been trying to like, it's like almost people view it like with morality. Um, like, oh, well, you just don't care about yourself. And like, that's why you did that. Or like, wow, I can't believe she's not going to beat up on herself for doing that. Like, that's clearly the wrong choice. Again, who is that helping? Like you said, it's just, it's not productive. If it worked, okay, sure. Maybe we would do it, but it doesn't, yeah. it just doesn't, it doesn't work. We don't recommend treatment that, you know, it's not like if the COVID vaccine came out and was 10% effective, you would recommend it. We, we just wouldn't. So if we know that dieting is like even less than 10% effective, why would we recommend that? Why yeah. would we just, we don't, we shouldn't. Um, and then what are some additional resources that you give your patients that you like some of your favorite resources that you like to give your patients? Yeah. So I really love, um, the book, the body is not an apology by Sonia Renee Taylor. Um, we've talked before how Black women kind of pioneered the body positive movement. Um, and that book is really important. And she has a couple like really good thought provoking questions that you can kind of go towards um, to get a little bit more practice in 
body positivity. Um, and, you know, since there's so many different pieces of this, like we're talking about body positivity, but we're also talking about intuitive eating because they're so intertwined. Um, so the intuitive eating workbook by Evelyn Triboli is a great one as well. It's like totally interactive. You basically go through and decide like what thoughts you still have left over from like a diet culture mindset. You're getting a good gauge on where you're at. I use it with clients all the time that will kind of go through it alongside together. Um, she also has another, a book out, Evelyn Triboli, they, and her and Elise Retch, I think her name is, um, they basically come together and they're like the founders of intuitive eating. There's also, um, I just looked it up and I think it's just like intuitive eating.com is the website. And there's a lot of research on that. There's, I think it's, let's see, I'm going to, oh yeah, intuitive eating.org. And that basically goes through the 10 principles and she talks about um, different resources, right? Like a lot of people are like, where's the science behind all this? Well, we're starting to get some research on this and that's included there. So if you're someone who's like, I'm not really a believer because I don't think, you know, I don't think this is true or something. There's a lot of really good science um, articles and scholarly journals and studies that have been done. So that's a really good resource as well that I'll give to people who are feeling a little, um, worried about it. That's awesome. Yeah. Honestly, mm -hmm. I just send people to you. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's true. Or your local intuitive eating dietitian. <laughs> uh, whenever I'm like working with somebody and, and everything I'm saying is just not like resonating with them for whatever reason, I'm like, maybe you need somebody who specializes in this topic. Like, why don't you just yeah. go see my friend Emily? And I give yeah. <laughs> so, um, but thank you for that. I think those are all really great recommendations. Um, okay, so to close this out, I just wanted for us to both give some closing comments to people. Um, I had a and I had a conversation with somebody who was telling me, you know, I've been to a number of you know naturopaths or even acupuncturists are guilty of this at times, um, and they just. I felt like they were fat shaming me is what she said. She's like, I just like felt like they kept asking me about my diet. I told them about my diet and then they kept wanting to dive into it more and more and more. And they just couldn't believe because it felt like because of how my size, they couldn't believe that I had a healthy diet. They just couldn't believe it. They wanted me to tell them like, okay, yeah, I did binge on like a, you know, carton of cookies last night or something like that. Mm -hmm. Um, and she's like, and I just didn't understand why it was relevant. And, um, you know, I've, I've been in holistic, you know, in holistic health school, you know, I, I went for a number of years, I have a doctorate in acupuncture. And um, I do think that in a lot of these programs, there is a lot of there is a fixation on diet and for good reason. But I, I think you also just have to listen to your patients. And I would just really, really like, try to, I guess, warn practitioners that your that your com like your words are meaningful and powerful people view you as a doctor whether you have a doctorate or a master's or even if you just have a certificate people think that you are some sort of an authority on something and your words are really powerful and really meaningful and you need to to have a lot of intention with with the advice and and the things that you're talking about because um yeah, because you can really like, you, you can really harm somebody's mental health and, um, mm -hmm. and create like, create phobias around things that maybe that person hadn't even thought of before and or just hurt their feelings. And, you know, as practitioners, as health practitioners, as doctors, we are supposed to do no harm first. Um, so just really think about that. And one of the best pieces of advice that I ever got from one of my teachers was, your patient will tell you exactly what is wrong with them they might not have the words, like they might not have the, the diagnosis in their head, but they will sit there and they will tell you their symptoms. And that with them telling you those symptoms, they will be telling you exactly what is wrong with them. You need to listen to your patients. And I think a lot of times it can be like very easy for someone to come in and you already have a preconceived notion of, of what's going on with them just by reading their intake. And, and, um, you need to really listen to what they're saying. Like a perfect example is, <clears throat> I mean, there's red, there's medical red flags for a reason, right? Like perfect example is I had a patient who came in one time for cupping who had um, 
shoulder pain. He said he had, he injured his shoulder girl. He was a firefighter. He uh, had been working out really hard and thinks he overworked out and, and his shoulders just been killing him. And then he starts telling me about his symptoms. He's like, yeah, every time I like stand up from a laying down position, or if I bend over to tie my shoes or something like God, it just aches right in my sternum. And I was like, oh, that is, that's not shoulder girdle pain. You need to go see your doctor, you know? Mm -hmm. And he came back and he was like, yeah, I had a pericarditis. He had an infection in his heart. So you got to listen to what people are telling you, because if I had just been like, yeah, okay, let's cut your shoulder and sent right. him on his way, maybe he never would have thought twice about it. And, you know, that is a little right. disease, so, or, you know, condition. So anyway, your words matter, listen to your patients and like have intention. That's, yeah, what that's so important. And that can go for anybody, not even just like a health practitioner, but just like, even if your friend is, is coming to you with something, you know, it's important to listen to them and also like pay attention to what, to the advice you're giving them because that's probably meaningful to them. So anyway, those are my closing comments. How about you? <laughs> yes. Yeah, so it's funny. Um, it's so similar to what you're saying, but almost, um, you know, there's a lot of resources like you can look for a haze aligned, like H A E S health at every size, therapist, dietitian, acupuncturist, physician, naturopath, all of that. Um, those resources are available. Um, I know in Portland, there's like a lot of different Facebook groups about it. Um, so it's so important what these practitioners are saying, because you do have so much power and it's so important as on the kind of flip side, I'll talk about as the patient or client, or whatever, who is seeing that provider to know your rights in the situation and to know um, how to kind of navigate that and how to decide, okay, is this like an, a good, helpful situation for me? Or is this person, this provider being dismissive or are they judging me based on size um, either way, really, or are they not like allowing me to speak what my truth is and listening to that, you know, like, I think we talked before about how you don't need to be weighed at the physician or something, um, you know, little things like that. So I like to focus on cultivating that kind of internal power and um, confidence in my patients so that when they do see a provider, they've already got it all figured out. They're like, okay, you're here to help me out. And if that's not what's happening, then we've got to shift gears and find somebody else. Um, so I think it's so important what you're saying with the healthcare providers and it's so important for you as a person to have that discernment and know, okay, when is this good? When is this bad? Um, and to just feel super confident in yourself that way. Awesome. Well, thanks. This has been a really fun series and um, I've really enjoyed it. It's actually been like rather cathartic to me as well. So even if nobody listens, I just have just really. <laughs> um, yeah, so much fun. Yeah. And so, you know, if people are ever interested in anything that I provide or Emily provides, you know, you can find me at Holistically Driven on Instagram, um, or you can find Zen Space PDX, Zen Space Wellness in, in Portland, Oregon, or the Cupping Studio in Portland, Oregon, or the Wellness Doctors in Portland, Oregon. Um, and you can find me there. And that's all in the link in my bio on Instagram. And Emily, where can people find you? Yeah, so I'm Emily Ray Wellness on Instagram. And then my website is emilyraywellness.com. Super easy. Um, and I have any resources there that you need if you have inquiries about working one on one intuitive eating counseling. Awesome. Bye. Bye.